I really personally don't consider myself an artist. I consider myself a designer that uses art to communicate my ideas. I actually have much more respect for artists. An artist really has to be comfortable revealing themselves to the world in their, through their art. We as designers just provide a solution and we use art to communicate how that's gonna be solved. We never really are exposing ourselves to the world. Have you ever thought about how you design a toothbrush or a table or even a pair of shoes? It, it almost sounds too simple, right? I mean, you know, toothbrush goes in your mouth and you scrub, 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 a table, it's got some legs, shoes go over your feet and maybe some laces. Or what about the pinnacle of all design projects, an automobile? Well, if you can design a toothbrush by taking into account your user, having some empathy for that user, and a good sense of aesthetics, then you can have the illustrious title of an industrial designer. A career that, to be honest, is probably one of the coolest design-related careers out there. I'm your host, Bobby Brill, and in this episode of Creative Mind, I talk with Antonio Borja, a former creative designer at General Motors, a former student here at the Academy of Art University, and now, of course, the director of the School of Industrial Design. And after, of course, we hear about his origin story, we dive deep into what type of thinking goes on in the head of an industrial designer. And in many of the past podcast episodes, we have seen where you start out in life is not always where you end up. And Antonio's path from Mexico to Detroit is a great story, so please do stick around. But a few things before we get into it. Please check out our new Facebook page at, of course, facebook.com slash Podcast where we will be bringing you more videos, images, and talks with all of our past and future guests, including a great six-part documentary series that follows a semester-long collaboration with the School of Industrial Design and Subaru. So check that out as well. And as always, please hit subscribe on whatever device you're listening to so you never miss an episode of Creative Mind. Now, here's Antonio Borja. How does your story start going from Mexico to the U.S. What was that like for you as a kid? I was fortunate. We grew up in a ranch, and our family also had a banana and a mango plantation. So we're from the very tropical region in, uh, in Mexico. So, I mean, as a kid, I mean, I, you can find me running around amongst the cows. You can find my Doberman with me at my side, my parrot on my shoulder. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I was a, basically, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I got into, I, I would say I got into a lot of trouble because I was very curious about everything pretty much. And But what a um, place to get in trouble to. That's awesome. Like for, to give you an example, I mean, we had... Uh, the canals that be on the hills, hillside for water for the banana plantations and the mango plantations were kids. So water slide, right? Oh, of course. <laughs> Jump on there. <laughs> Parents weren't too happy about it, but, you know, for, for us and, and my cousins, I mean, that was it, that was fun. I mean, we were able to, again, pretty much explore nature and, and, you know, there wasn't really anything to stop us. We had my dog was my guardian pretty much, oh, wow. uh, you know, but obviously I had to let my mom know where I was at. But I would say that that freedom to roam is what kind of lent it towards my natural curiosity towards things because it's like, okay, I wonder what's over there. Or like, what, is, what makes this work? Or like, how does this come together? And, and so, you know, like I said, I think I was really fortunate in that. And then, you know, my, my father and my, and my mom both immigrated and I immigrated with them as well to L.A., and once I was in L.A., I remember it was like a big culture shock for me because, for sure. I mean, one of the first things was like being served cold milk. And I okay. was like, what is this about? Why is it cold? <laughs> like, it's supposed to be warm. <laughs> and they're like, no, it's, it's you know, store-bought milk. And like, I, I remember it. I, and to this day, I still really don't like milk unless it's steamed. <laughs> it's funny. My, my brother-in-law is like that. He's from India. And like I was at his house and he was pouring milk on his cereal and then put it in the microwave. Yeah. And he, he caught me looking and he goes, I didn't grow up on cold milk. It, it's, it's weird. So yeah. So that was one of those things where it was like, okay. And then all of a sudden, obviously, you know, I get introduced to a whole different lifestyle in the sense that, you know, there's cars that are around me where before there's horses and and cows and I mean we had cars as well too but it was LA is, is it a concrete was, jungle. exactly exactly it was where in LA were you, where did you start when we first moved we lived pretty much in South Central LA okay I went to school in Wattsworth Elementary School okay which is right off of MLK yeah right by the Watts Towers there yeah okay. so it was you know uh, as a kid you know we 
we had a lot of fun. I remember one of the classes, one of my favorite classes that we had is where, you know, basically back then in the L.A. district, everyone, I think everyone got an IQ test. And that's what allowed you to get placed in whatever classes you were going to be in. And so it was cool. You know, we got to we got to get placed in, in a class where we had we were like the one of the only classes that had all Macs. Oh, wow. So we had a Mac lab, you know, and we would we play around on, on our Macs. And then we also that was the first time I got introduced to electronics and how to, like, make your own devices, pretty much. And we had and to make this a, is at LAUSD. Yeah, this, this is, is regular L.A. public school. OK. Yeah. OK. And basically. We had a bunch of radio kits, and, you know, you had to wind. Yeah, the little crystal, the crystal kits. <laughs> correct, yeah. Correct, yeah, and we're over there, you know, hooking it up to the fence, trying to get boost the signal as well, too, for, you know, with our antenna. And so, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think when I moved here and I got exposed to that, I mean, it definitely, curiosity was already there, but this just kind of, like, took it to another level. I mean, yeah. every toy that I got, you know, it was like I would play with it for about five, ten minutes, and then my curiosity got the best of me. It's like, okay. How does this thing really work? And that's where I would start taking things apart. And luckily, I was able to put most of them back together and get them to work again, <laughs> which is why, you know, at first, you know, my mom would always say, like, why are you breaking all the toys we buy? I'm like, I'm not breaking. I'm just trying to find out how it works, you know. Or well, like, well, what was the reason for moving from, from Mexico and then into South Central LA? Basically, my, my dad wanted us to, to live in the States. Okay. My, my mom, all her family is in Mexico. Most of them are still in Mexico, but we do have a few do you uh, still have aunts the ranch? and uncles. Uh, yeah, it's still part of the family. Oh, wow. Yeah, and again, it's uh, it's now you know part of our extended cousins since they're the ones that are down there and they okay. they still run the the land, and they also have a plastics uh, company in Mexico City as well. Oh, okay. So that that was another thing that kind of introduced me to like making things. You know, yeah. it's like the family business was to make plastic goods. Uh, and so that's something that, you know, I was around that. So you, were, you were prototyping long before you knew you were prototyping. <laughs> Correct. Pretty much. Yeah. I didn't know it. Yeah. So for me, like I said, it was one of those things where, um, you know, my dad's like, you know, there's just going to be better opportunities for my son to, to grow up in the States. And how was that? Because I know, I know Watts has its own vision of what people think Watts is like. How was it growing up in Watts? I mean, it's a little rough and tumble. It was. It was. I mean, I, I uh, you know, I was there until pretty much the end of fourth grade. I was fortunate in the sense that I made friends with everyone. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't, you know, I had, you know, there, you definitely had like the, the gangs and all that stuff going on. But my dad did a good job. I mean, he, his business took off. He's always been an entrepreneur. His business started taking off and we moved to Glendale you know, within a year and a half. Okay. And so then things got better, but still, you know, you still have the both sides. But for me, I just learned from an early age, like I'm not going to associate myself with, you know, being part of one group or another group on myself. And then, you know, people who like to succeed and like what I do are going to come around me and I'm going to go around people that I, you know, want to be like as well too. So I quickly learned how to like create a nice little social network around myself of a group of friends that, I knew had ambitions to just to be more than what what they were currently. Were they were they doing some of the the design or some of the the same curiosity bent that you had as a kid? Yeah, I think the majority of them were really creative kids. I mean, I think kids are just naturally inquisitive, right? Of, of looking at things and and want, trying to understand how things work. I know for me, art was something that was really big, um, just because. We had like pottery classes, you know, we would always be painting and whatnot. Quite frankly, I wasn't very good at it because for me, I was, you know, my my mom's focus was more, you're going to be really good at math, you're going to be really good at <laughs> physics, things are going to work out, right? <laughs> That's all you need in life. Exactly. You'll be good. Yeah, I'll be good. And um, so art for me was just more always like an outlet, like just a creative outlet. Like this is a lot of fun, you know. I never really saw it as, as work or homework per se, you know, okay. I just did it because... I want to create this cool thing. So I need all these things and I just make it happen. Where for like homework, like math and, and physics and, you know, biology and all that stuff, it was, it was like, okay, this is just homework. I need to, need to get good at it. Luckily, math, I was something that it was just natural. I mean, all our family, I mean, one of my cousins is a mathematician. So it was just, it just made sense to me. It just was just in logical. The DNA. Yeah. And okay. it was just like where everyone else would struggle with them. Like, why are they having so much problem with this? 
It's just logical. It's this, this. <laughs> <laughs> Variables, guys, solve for them. So you'll be good. Um, so, but, you know, it was nothing that ever interests me. But I think a lot of my counselors would see that. And that was one of the main reasons why initially when I, you know, when I was in high school and then starting to transition into like, look, you know, what am I going to do? What is there for me to do? Like, I, I love tinkering with stuff. I like art. But most of them would look at my grades and say, like, you know, you can be an engineer. My mom would make me take summer classes at Los Milanos Community College. This is when we moved up to the okay. Bay Area here to Pittsburgh. And so I would take summer, uh, I would take uh, math classes in summer oh my to gosh. get ahead. Oh, man. So, you know, as a sophomore, I was taking calculus. So she was really, really pushing you. Yeah, I mean, she to, just said, to, you know, this to, is where to you're going to be. Like, this is what the family's good at, <laughs> pretty much. And, and so, yeah, so, you know, for me, it was... I was going to go down that path of being an engineer, mechanical engineering. Typically, anytime you tell anyone that, hey, I like cars or I like making things, like, yeah. oh, you're going to be a mechanical, mechanical engineer. engineer. That's yeah. it. And so, yeah, so that was that, that was really the, the big push there in the sense that, you know, I, I think, again, at an early age, I was really exposed to a lot of these classes where we had to make things ourselves. And I really, I really have a lot of, you know, good memories looking back at that time because, you know, we would work together as a team to get our radios to work or to get our little, you know, trinkets of whatever we were making, little solar panels. I think on one of them we were making like little simple solar pa uh, solar panel or solar powered uh, cars, you know. Oh my just so like, you were really, I mean, you were doing full on design yeah, and engineering. Mean, it was just, but again, for kids, you don't really think of it as that. Yeah, it's just, it's, you're it's making a, model. a thing, you're, you're mm -hmm. making it move. <laughs> and so basically... You know, getting exposed to that, I think it's what would really like, you know, open up my my mind to saying like, hey, it, this actually can be something that I would want to do. And it doesn't was, feel like work. Was there a car culture thing going on or was, was LA, that something yeah, in for, LA, for you? Yeah, in L.A. And even when I was in the ranch. I mean, my mom would always tell me it was like every time any of my uncles came to visit or any of my aunts would come to visit. They would always know to bring little Tonito, which is what they call me affectionately, a car. Okay. They always bring me a car model okay, and because they knew that that's what I loved. So, you know, even though, like I said, I was surrounded by horses and all these animals in the ranch, you know, I, I was always exposed to cars. And, and it was something that I, you know, I, that's what I love to play with. What was the car? What was your favorite uh, model car? What was the one you? I think when I was a kid, I, I rem the one that I remember the most is a yellow C4 Corvette that I got. Okay. It was it was a remote control one, and it was just like I was over the moon because it had the pop up lights. Oh wow! So it was something that I was just like <laughs> I was completely smitten when I got it, and I was like, when you graduated high school, then what was the the goal? So your mom's telling you, okay, you're gonna be a mechanical engineer. You're thinking mechanical engineer. But well, not only my mom, I think it was also counselors, because a lot of counselors don't, just don't, they don't really know a lot about art and design. You know, it's always seen as like a auxiliary field that it just exists, but no one really knows what, right, what yeah. happens. Upon graduating, you know, I enrolled in, uh, in DVC. My cousin did as well. He went to Cal Poly, mathematician. What's DVC? Diablo Valley, Valley College. Okay. This is in uh, Pleasant Hill. And basically, so I enrolled in junior college, you know, I tried to get all my two-year classes out of the way, all the general ed stuff out of the way. You know, I met with the counselors there too and their and their advisors and I would tell them like, yeah, I want to design cars. That's what I want to do for a living. It's like, okay, yeah, you're gonna be a mechanical engineer. That's what they do. It's like, all right, great. That's made sense. That, that's but the then only I'm option in drafting had. classes and I'm like, I don't want to draft anything for like hours on end. Like this is not this is boring to me. This is repetitive work. Nothing against people that draft. It just wasn't my wasn't your thing. my passion. Yeah, I was more into like I want to create and define what the vehicle is going to do, how it's going to look, how it's going to function. But again, I had no clue that there was a field. And then I actually happened to run across a brochure of industrial design, and that's where I was like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to be an industrial designer. I want to be a car designer. Because yeah, industrial design. I mean. I've worked tangentially with you in your department for a couple of years now, and every time you see somebody doing industrial design, it's like, I mean, your just head explodes. It's like, oh, this is everything. Yeah. This is literally every yeah. skill set an artist can have. It's all the math, all the design, all of the pretty, all of the functionality, all of the cool in one thing. I mean, I'm jealous yeah. when I go to industrial design because <laughs> it's like, oh, they get to do massive machines and make really cool things. Yeah, one, and like I said, once I realized like this field existed, there was like, okay, 
that's what I want to do. And I, you know, quickly asked my advisors, like, okay, what are, what are some of the industrial design programs around here? And, you know, they mentioned San Jose State Art Center, Academy of Art. And my mom really just wanted, and I also really just wanted to stay close to home too. So, you know, I, I, I came to the academy. I remember I took one class because at first I wanted to see uh-huh. if I was going to like it because, you know, it still was kind of like... Big step. Yeah, I mean, it was like, I'm super excited about it, but I'm like, I don't want the excitement to get the best of me. I want to make sure that this is going to be right. I still remember my first class. It was, um, I took a uh, development of form class and it was just, yeah, this is where I belong. In that development of form class, what was that light bulb moment for you? I think that the, the first time that I got to see how I could design something and sketch it out and then within the same day make a prototype of it and then have a functional product by the end of the day and it was like this idea just came from something that I just sketched it was just something here I brought it to paper and then I brought it to life I thought there was something really powerful about that it's like I'm getting to create products for people like this is really cool this Um, this this, it's going straight from your head into the, the world yeah. in a day. And then I get to, you know, showcase it to my friends, my, my classmates and whatnot. They give me feedback on it. We make changes to it and we make it better and we improve it. And it's like, wow, like this is never ending fun. It's like you're going to be in the sandbox. You're going to make cool castles. You're going to tear them down and make some more new ones the next day. And it's like it just doesn't stop, right? Because if you think about it, I mean, we design products, but as you know, perfection is still elusive. We design these great products. They're perfect for the time. But as, as people evolve, as time, you know, as time goes on, the needs and the wants become different. So mm. things need to be redesigned. Right. You know, what we felt was the greatest thing, you know, that for consumer electronics, for example, what was the best phone last year is now old news within right. six months. Car design is kind of similar as well, too. You know, the, for the, the next model year or four years, you know, every four years, usually you have a major facelift. And it's like, okay, now this car that which once seemed to be like the perfect, you know, resemblance or the perfect personification of the brand seemed like you couldn't top that. Now it becomes, you know, obsolete, not obsolete, but definitely it becomes a statement of what that brand was at that point in time. What is it? The, the Honda, the Hyundai accent or the, what was it? Or the Aztec? Is that one? That was the Pontiac the, Aztec. The Pontiac Aztec yeah. <laughs> is the one. So interesting story about that, though, because when I, so when I, well, we're fast forwarding here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But when I, I joined GM, that was one of the projects I had asked about. I was like, you know, so like what, what was the story behind the Pontiac Aztec, you know? And like you ask it, not because you're poking fun, but you just kind of want to know. Yeah, how, how did that happen? And one of the things that, you know, the designers told us is like, well, that was our first attempt at just doing everything digital and not having clay. And there's a reason why <laughs> yeah. it looks great on rendering to looks great on sketches. But when we saw it in real life, it wasn't really translating to what we saw on there. And so that's quickly, they realized like, hey, you know, like as much as we like this new process of creating everything digitally and just printing or not printing it out, but like, you know, manufacturing from data, we still need the hand to touch the surface and to finesse the surfaces and to see them and one to one go and make adjustments to them then. But that was one of the things that, at least that was one of the things that I was told and, I, and it made a lot of sense. Like, okay, I can see that because I'm like, the sketches of it were always pretty, they looked pretty good, you know? And the concept, the concept honestly, it was quite, quite forward of its time. I mean, the fact that it's a multi-use vehicle. I mean, this is before, you know, crossovers were at right. their craze that they are today. The fact that you can, you know, build your tent out from the back when the the cargo gate was open and all that. It had a lot of really cool features of like, you know, being able to wash out the interior and all that stuff. So a lot of really cool functional things that were in the design. Yeah, it's funny. As I I mentioned, it is a a, a laughing point. And, you know, we'll talk about that later. Subaru, you know, I'm remembering some of that stuff from Subaru. It's like, hey, maybe that's going to be the car of the future that has these living spaces built into it and, sure. and different ideas. So it's kind of, yeah. And I, and I think again, you know, and that's where, you know, you'll see that a lot of companies typically they're, they're hesitant to introduce too many new variables at the same time. You can push it too far and the public's just not ready for that. So a lot of times you have to put intermediate models or like, you know, stepping stones. So that way you can adjust <laughs> Educate people as they exactly. Go. Okay. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, we saw the same thing happen with the uh, with the iPhone, right? Yeah. First iPhone had a bunch of skewerisms in its design, so you know your notepad looked like an actual little notepad. Yeah. The timer looked like a, a timer. Yeah. yeah, you know the microphone, and now it's just the 
you know, the actual WAV or wave signal on, on, on the uh, recording there. So those are things that if they would have done that right away, people would have been taken aback. Like, what is this thing? You know, this is an alien foreign thing. You so know? the Tesla truck may be the coolest thing ever in 15 years. <laughs> you know what? I mean, that was, that was, uh, so we, I mean, I was down in LA when it got unveiled and, uh, you know, that was a big discussion that we had. I mean, I th again, I think when you look at industrial design and what we teach our students to do, which is have empathy for who you're designing for, so what are their wants, what are their needs, what are they going to be their nice to haves. Also have empathy for society, like what, what is, what can this vehicle be and how is it going to exist around, you know, other vehicles and how is it going to live in, in, in a day to day environment, you know. The next thing is we say, you know, you have to make sure that it's also logical. It has to make sense. So you have empathy, you have logic. Those two things are what sets up your project because empathy is, again, understanding who the user is, who is going to be designed for. The logic is making sure that the technology is there, the price points make sense, the sustainability makes sense, you know, the products, the, the actual materials that you're using make sense for the application that you're trying to do. And then, and then pretty much the next thing that sits on top of that, I'm drawing a vastly a simplified diagram here. <laughs> and then what sits on top of that is aesthetics, right? So aesthetics is what comes in and makes people want it, makes people identify it with the brand. It's got to be cool, but also just, you know, we have different brands because different people want to project, you know, themselves in different ways. So that's one of the main reasons we have multiple brands. And, you know, most conglomerates usually have three or four brands under their umbrella that they control. And it's for that reason. And so basically, once we have those things where the intersection of those three elements intersect, that's where you're going to have your design. You mentioned empathy and, you know, pretty much everyone we've talked to so far has said that same thing. Chuck Pyle talked about in his illustration career that if you're illustrating, you need to illustrate with empathy or you're telling a story that people can empathize with. Um, we had some other designers talk about always having empathy in what they were doing. And that to me is not something I often think about when I'm thinking about an artist that almost that, that psychological connection with people. And how, how important is that in, you know, industrial design when you're designing a toothbrush or a car or something like that? I think now the way we really look at designing things is we really try to ask ourselves, okay, what, what's the main goal that we're trying to accomplish here? So if we do a study of a day in the life of a certain person, like this is what they do, they get up in the morning, they do X, Y, Z. Then at that point, we look at this is their day today. Where are their pay points, pain points that we can remove from their life okay. and make their lives better? Because this is, I mean, at the end of the day, that's, our goal as industrial designers is to make life better for everyone. Make, make, life, make life painless. As painless as it can be, at least. And, you know, as you know, you pretty much from your, actually, from the point you go to bed, beds are also most of the time designed as well, to the toothbrush, and to your cell phone, your computer, your sneakers, all that stuff is designed by industrial designers. Right. And so basically for us, it's like, okay, well, let's look at their, their lifestyle. Let's look at their a day in the life of the week, of the weekend, of vacation time, of, you know, them having a special getaway with their friends and family, right? We look at those things and we ask ourselves, what experience, what new experience can we create to make people's lives better? And that's how we're designing most products today. We don't even take into consideration really just the hardware or just the software. They're both in unison being worked on. And that's, again, you design the experience first, and then you design all the assets that are necessary to make that experience happen. And I know we're going to talk about cars predominantly, but that is everything industrial designers. Right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, because in, in, our, in our department, I mean, and this is kind of one of the things that we've been talking about recently is this we say industrial design and people just don't get it at first because they're like, what? You're in a factory designing stuff? Like, no. <laughs> no, we got a team, team of robots <laughs> working around the clock. We just <laughs> sit there and push buttons. Yeah. And it's like, no, I mean, the only reason the word industrial is in there is because we tend to mass produce the ideas that we come up with so that they make an impact in people's lives. Yeah. Right. If I make a one off and it's a wonderful thing, but I can't 
it's not a democratic product because I can't share it with the rest of the world. I'm not going to, I'm going to make a change in one person's life and that's going to be great. But if I have the opportunity to change millions of people's lives, that's going to be much more impactful. And that's where the word industrial comes from. And the fact that our ideas have to be mass produced okay. and there, and that's, it's worldly thinking as opposed to fine art gallery thinking. Correct. Okay. And so in, within our umbrella, I mean, our students can study everything from furniture design to toy design to product design. And product design can include footwear design, personal electronics, consumer electronics, medical equipment. And then we also have transportation as well. So it's a really wide gamut of areas that students can go into and make, a, make an impact on the world. I have to say this because, again, all the time that I go over there and, and, and work with you guys and see the students, it does affect more of my decision making process every day. Because my wife and I were shopping for a car end of last year, and I had a Chevy Cruze. Nice car. We bought it new, except it had a very massive design flaw in my, in my thinking. So the way I got in, I banged my shin in the same spot once a week. And immediately, I didn't care what the car was. I didn't care how much it cost when we got a new one. I was like, if I bang my shin, I'm not getting into this car. We are getting back in our car and we're driving to another yeah. dealership. And three times, I won't mention the cars we didn't get, but they were all high end because we ended up getting an Audi. But all the car, these luxury cars we got into, I was like, boom, nope, we're done. I physically am not going to enjoy this car. I just need to walk away. Yeah. And that's the reason why we have multiple brands because, you know, we don't, we can't, we have yet to design the right answer for everyone. Yeah. So with that, I mean, like what I would tell you, a cool story about that is we went to the LA Auto Show this last, um, this last fall and the CA team was there, uh, Vlad and Tristan. Vlad uh, did the exterior of the new Corvette, the C8, and Tristan did the interior. And that was one of the things that they had discussed about, you know, they... They reinforced the center beam of that car so that ingress and egress was a lot easier, being that, you know, most of the time, a lot of the Corvette clientele tends to be older, even though this car is designed to appeal to a younger clientele. But it's something that it was cool to see that even though in this really high-end supercar, like, they're still paying attention to the human component. The person who's actually going to be buying right. it, as opposed to, right. you know, yeah. that, that user study is a little skewed, a little older, a little more mature. That was just one thing that they did to respect their current customer. Mm. But if you look at the styling and the, now that it's a mid-engine and everything, they did everything else to attract younger clientele yeah. towards the brand. And I think they're going to be successful with it. You come to the academy here and you focus primarily on, on industrial design. Is it, are you working on transportation or where is your focus in industrial design at that point? All I ever wanted to do was just work on cars, design cars. Quite frankly, not even work on them. I, I enjoy driving them more than working on them. I changed transmissions and all that fun <laughs> stuff too because I wanted it to go faster. <laughs> Not necessarily because I was like, you know what? I want to get dirty this weekend <laughs> and wrench on my car. It was more like, okay, where do I need to make it go fast? And this is what needs to happen. And, you know, I ordered a custom engine from, it was Central Mustangs back then in, uh, in Tehachapi, California. Crate motor shows up to my to my front yard. My mom's like, why is there a big rig parked in front of our house? <laughs> so, oh, my motor just came. Uh, Your what? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, Again, it was just something that I, I've always enjoyed and, you know, going out and, and, and driving my cars and, and having a lot of fun with them. And so anytime I ran in across into anything that I felt was going to make that experience better, I would go out and make it happen. So there you go. There's a little bit of the origin story of Antonio Borja, the director of the School of Industrial Design here at the Academy of Art University. Tomorrow, we'll delve deeper into what it means to be an industrial designer, what that actual term means. We're going to talk more about cars, more about design, more about being a working artist and what happens after you graduate. So definitely check out the next episode and please check out our new Facebook page at facebook.com slash creative mind podcast for all the cool videos, links and past podcast information and all of our future guests. And most importantly, please hit subscribe on whatever device you're listening to. And thank you again for listening to creative mind.